Hi everyone, welcome back to this series of PMP practice questions, specifically from the Pumbok Guide 7th edition for this lot, which is really great. The latest edition of the Pumbok Guide, the project management body of knowledge. And by answering these questions, we're gonna get all these insights into, you know, into the answers and into the way the Pumbok Guide works. It's a great way to study and a great way to prepare for your PMP exam. Let's get into these questions. 10 questions, scenario based, a little bit tricky. It's gonna be a bunch of fun. First question, you're working on a project where you have been completing the deliverables in sequence and the project work is starting to fall behind. The project sponsor asks you to speed up the work and reduce the time for the project to be delivered, but also makes it very clear that there is no more money to use when speeding up the work. What will you do next? Okay, so we've got sequence here. Oh, and it looks like we've got a few different options around uh, schedule, around improving the schedule. So bringing our schedule back on track. We've got leads and lags. Um, okay, but what are we trying to do here? We're doing things in sequence. We have no more money, unfortunately. Uh, and so we can't use schedule crashing. So schedule crashing is where we're throwing money and resources at the, at the schedule to bring it back on track. So we can put that out of, uh, out of our minds because we don't have any extra money here. Uh, leads and lags, we could use that, but I think we need more information around that. It's, it needs to be more specific. So let's say no to that one for now. Resource leveling is when we're taking items that are being done at the same time and instead doing them in sequence. Uh, for example, if they're both assigned to the same person, like these two tasks, they can't be done by the same person at the same time. So they need to be leveled out. Uh, so that's actually the opposite of what we're wanting. But schedule fast tracking is when we're bringing in items uh, and doing them in parallel to each other. So that uh, now hopefully we're bringing the schedule back on track because we're doing them sooner instead of one after the other. That's fast tracking. And I think that's the one that we're going to go for. Answer B, fantastic. Project fast tracking is a schedule compression method. So we're compressing our schedule in which activities or tasks that are normally done in sequence are performed in parallel at the same time. Schedule crashing includes adding people to activities, working overtime, or paying to expedite deliveries. And we've got page 59 under schedules, fast tracking and crashing in the Pumbok Guide, seventh edition. Great way to start us off. That is really good. And a whole bunch of information just in that first question. Let's see what we've got next. After reviewing your project schedule, you notice you are behind by three weeks and the schedule needs to be compressed. Excellent, because we've just learned all about that. So <laughs> your project does not have enough budget to crash the schedule. That sounds familiar. You check with the lead for each area and review the schedule as to whether they can fast track their deliverables. What will you do next? And we know about that, so that's doing, that, doing them in parallel instead of in sequence, bringing it back in line. But we're fast tracking all these items, but it looks like we're doing, okay, which one are we going to do? With, which, with what sort of dependency are we going to do the fast tracking on? So which items can we easily move on our schedule? Can we move the industry regulated ones? Probably not, um, usually because you know, there's a lot, of, lot more uh, checks and balances, a lot more regulation, uh, a lot more oversight on that one. Let's put a low maybe on that one for now. External dependencies, also very difficult to move because we don't own those dependencies usually. They're external to our team, hard to move. Let's put a low maybe for that one. Mandatory dependencies, they are set in stone. You know, they have to be done in a certain order or they have to rely on this one or that one. So again, hard for that one to move. Discretionary though, is just at someone's discretion. So you know, it, 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 they may want it or they may not want it, um, but it's not, it's not a hard dependency, it's not set in stone. That one is much easier to move. So I think for our purposes, let's go with answer A. All right, doing well. When compressing the schedule, some activities cannot be fast-tracked because of the nature of the work, while others can. A discretionary dis dependency is based on project preferences, so, and it might be modifiable. External and mandatory dependencies usually cannot be modified. Internal dependencies might be modifiable, except when based on specific regulatory needs. 
So regulatory needs, not good for us. But internal dependencies we might be able to do, but we didn't have that really specifically mentioned here either. So, all right, that was really good. Wow, we're really getting through these. You're doing a great job. How did you go with that one? I think that was a, another good addition to our schedule compression, compression techniques. <laughs> Hard to say, but uh, easy to get it right for us. Let's see what we've got next. Okay, your team are new to Agile. Uh, we've got Agile and have previously been working with Waterfall. Okay, maybe moving from Waterfall to Agile. Your key customer asks you for a project schedule. The project team believes using a project schedule is from the old Waterfall way of working and they shouldn't have to create one. What will you do next? Uh, now that's not necessarily true, but maybe there's, an, maybe there's an Agile centric way of describing a project schedule. For example, a product roadmap would usually do the trick. Let's see what we have. Create a project Gantt chart to visualize the activities within the project. That's a yes, a product roadmap can be a Gantt chart as well. So let's put a maybe for that one for now. Determine the project's planned versus actual value instead of working with a schedule directly. Uh, this one is more about the variance of the schedule. So what have we planned versus how is it actually going? It's not really agile centric, even though it's a good practice to do. So we could put a maybe, a low maybe for that one for now. Advise the customer that we don't need to plan ahead in an adaptive way of work. Not necessarily true. We, like, that's the whole point of a product roadmap so we can see the features that are coming up and make sure that they're adding value in the eyes of our customer. So I think what we've got here, D is looking a bit more promising. Ask your team to develop a high level release plan like a product roadmap, showing the features to be included in each release. As we're coming up and it's the coming up in the future, the time frame doesn't have to be exact, but this is what's coming up in the future. And we can usually tell when it's coming up based on how quickly we're completing our work, our velocity. So I think for our purposes, let's go with answer. D. All right, good stuff. Adaptive scheduling planning, adaptive schedule planning uses incremental planning. A high level release plan is developed that indicates basic features and functionality to be included in each release. And then if we're, uh, so those are the increments that we're delivering, in other words, that incremental planning. So that's really good to know. Page 61 under adaptive schedule planning in the Pumbok guide, seventh edition. Wonderful stuff. And I'm already learning more about the Pumbox 7th edition without having to actually read it myself. And that's even better. Even though it's not too bad, it's not as big as the 6th edition, which was a huge, huge book. We're really getting through these. You're doing great. You're working in a project team that has recently moved to an agile way of work. Your business analysts want to gather the requirements, solutions, match them to the scope and do a work breakdown structure for the whole deliverable. Your product owner says this will take too long and is not agile enough for their needs. Okay, what will you do next? Okay, is there another way to break it down perhaps uh, instead of doing it all in one go? Ask your team to review the scope management plan for the proper process. Uh, I think maybe there's a better answer than that one. Let's put a low maybe for now. Break the deliverable down into smaller pieces so you can deliver those faster. Yeah, that's definitely possible. Um, and then they could you know, analyze those smaller pieces as well. Potentially, that could work. Ask your team to time box work on the highest priority items in the backlog, update the estimates, and then reprioritize them as necessary. That's prob that sounds really quite good. Uh, obviously, we're prioritizing the highest items. Um, update the estimates for those highest priority items and then reprioritize them as necessary. Uh, we're time boxing the work, very agile centric, you know, lots of agile words there, you know, in, in that agile way of working, uh, time boxing, prioritizing. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty good one. Review the project charter for the high level scope and then use this to begin delivery quickly. Uh, I think there's definitely a better answer than that. We still need to plan properly whether we're working in an agile way or a waterfall way, we still need to do the proper um, you know, detail on the requirements and the scope and the solutions and that sort of thing. So between B and C, um, do we just break it down into smaller pieces? That might not actually fit you know, what we're doing. So 
uh, sometimes if we're just breaking it down into pieces, they still have to be usable pieces, really. Um, but this one, working on the highest priority items and then uh, getting them to analyze those highest priority items and reprioritizing as necessary, that one definitely sounds a lot better. Between those two, let's go with answer C and hope for the best. Okay, all right. That was actually a little bit tricky. Both of those were pretty good. Let's see if we get any tips here. Adaptive approaches often use time boxes, so that's good. The work is based on a prioritized backlog. That's what we're talking about. The project team determines the amount of work they can do in each time box, estimates the work and self-manages to accomplish that work. At this point, the backlog may be reprioritized for the next time box. So it basically is just describing an agile way of work uh, and then prioritizing those, those items to work on. So I guess that satisfies all of these things, moving to an agile way of work and uh, you know, ensuring that things, that they can start the work more quickly rather than doing all of the analysis for everything before they begin. And here we've got page 62 under time boxes in the PMBOK guide if you wanna check out that one for yourself, which I really do recommend. All right, how did you guys go with that one? That was a little bit trickier. Let's see what we have next. When reviewing the current progress of your, with your project sponsor, they notice that the system solution is missing a critical piece that will impact the benefit of the project. Okay, the project sponsor approves the scope. Okay, that's good to know. Your project has a planned value of 520,000 and an actual cost of 535,000. So we'd planned to be at 520, and, but where actual cost, so we've spent more than what we had planned to at this point. So 535. So we're behind our budget. Uh, so we're yeah, over our budget, sorry. Let's see what options we have. I'm not sure what we're trying to do here. Just to add this critical piece of scope, I suppose. Work with the PMO to unlock the project management reserves for the extra work. Okay, management reserves. Uh, as we've been through a few times, we've got our project budget, then we've got our contingency reserves for any risks that pop up. Uh, that becomes our, uh, I think, I can't remember the name of it, but over, the overall project budget to which we, and we add the management reserves on top of that for any scope that we didn't see, but that is, is actually part of the project is approved. So that actually does fit. That fits for what we're after here. I wonder if there's any other answers that fit as well? Let's have a quick look, but that one's looking pretty good. Ask the, priori uh, ask the product owner to reprioritize the backlog and see if the new work will fit. Um, I think if we do that, something else will have to be bumped out usually. Uh, and it doesn't say we're specifically working on an agile project either. So this could be any type or any style. Uh, let's put a maybe for now. Perform the work within your normal budget as your project is on track. Um, I think we can't do that because we are actually over budget. So that's a definite no, and that's very handy to know. So that's good. Raise a change request for the changes and gain approval for, from the change control board. I think that one is also good, um, but it looks as though the project sponsor has already approved that scope. So a project sponsor would usually be a part of the change control board, but it depends on the project, depends on what you've outlined in your change management plan. So the process for change management. Uh, either way, all of that to say, it's already been approved. I think we can say no there. That gives us, I think, answer A is gonna be our best one here. There it is. Management reserves are set aside for unexpected activities related to in-scope work. Depending on the organization's policies, management reserves may be managed by the PMO at the program or the portfolio level. Page 62, under budget, in the Pumba Guide, 7th edition. Really good to read up on, and you can go straight there. You don't have to search for that, uh, and that's really, really good to know. All right, how did you guys go with that one? Uh, I think these are, we're getting through them really well, so this is quite good, and we're halfway through this little section. You're doing a great job. Let's keep going. You're in the planning stages of an agile project where the functional manager and senior users have provided the high level requirements and scope. You have been asked to put together a project team that will be able to deliver quickly. What will you do next? Okay, so 
everything is ready to go. We need a team and to pull those guys together, it's a team that will be able to deliver quickly. So what are the features of a high performing team? Let's have a look. Select project team members from each city to ensure diversity of knowledge within the team. Uh, knowledge might be one thing. Let's put a low maybe for now because I think an Agile project specifically, we're looking for things like transparency in our work environment, but also co-location is always a big one. Where people can learn by osmosis, by overhearing th conversations and working together closely. Uh, so put together a resource management plan outlining the resources required. Uh, I think not just yet. Do we have a, a, you know, a strategy behind this? We're not sure yet. Let's put a maybe for now. Ask your PMO for current available resources and assign them to the work. I mean, yes, we'll probably do that as well. Uh, unless there's a better answer, those are, those are okay. Um, select a small team, okay, that sounds good, that can work in the same area so they can solve problems as they arise. All right, that actually sounds very good. And that's part of that co-location idea as well. Plus a small team keeps the communication channels small as well. Now I can never remember the formula, but basically uh, the more people you have, uh, it actually increases the communication channels. So between this guy, this guy, this guy, and this person, and then this person, this person, and then everyone interacting uh, and the ways that they can interact, it increases exponentially the more people you have. So that's why we ideally want to work in smaller teams. It actually keeps things a lot more simple. But for us, I think we're gonna go with answer D excellent work. When planning for the team, the project sponsor considers the ability and necessity for them to work in the same location. Small project teams that can work in the same room are able to take advantage of osmotic communication, and that's overhearing that information, conversations and uh, solving problems together quickly. Uh, and they can solve problems as they arise. So page 64, project team composition and structure in the Pumbok Guide 7th edition. All right, that's really good. Agile teams, very good to, information to have, very handy to know. How did you guys go with that one? All right, let's get into the next one. You are putting together a project team to deliver an accounting system to offices around the country. The accounting system you're moving to has not been used by anyone in your organization before. The project is quite high risk and the delivery needs to be right the first time. What will you do next? Okay. so. If it's quite high risk and it needs to be right first time, we might use a predictive or a waterfall way of work or an iterative way of work where we're iterating and then still releasing in one big bang. Um, so what are we going to do? And, oh, look at that. Oh, select a small team that can work in the same area so they can solve problems as they arise. Maybe that's the right answer again. <laughs> Who knows? Um, I mean, it certainly could work, but uh, I think we're looking for more other, thing, other things like uh, you know, it hasn't been used by anyone in our organization before. So that actually might not work for us. We might need some information from outside our organization. Let's think about that. Use a predictive project approach. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. And source part of your team externally, all right, if they have the skill sets in that new system. Oh, that's what we were just talking about. Very good. So that actually could be our one. That could be pretty good. Train existing internal staff in the new system and then have them work on the project. That also could be very good. Uh, you know, obviously that's, that, that's definitely a way of working. It might come with other problems um, because they may not know, you know ways of working in projects or not have worked on projects before. So you'll definitely be going through that forming, storming, norming um, stages of a team. Uh, so that could be a little bit painful as well. Let's put a, a maybe on that. It's pretty good, but I still like this one the best. Perform a make or buy analysis on the different software options. I think we're a little bit past that one at the moment. Uh, yep, yeah, I think we're past th that. We've already decided on that one. I think for our purposes, the best answer here, let's go with answer B. Okay, excellent. The benefit that outside skills bring to the project are weighed against the costs that will be incurred. With higher risk and a single delivery, a waterfall or predictive project delivery approach is best. So it covers a few different angles there and both of them are good. Page 63, project team composition and structure in the Pumbok Guide 7th edition. And that's really good to know. And that's good. Team structure, very handy. 
still usable in the real world as well. All right, we've only got three questions to go in this little section. You are doing great. You're putting together a project plan for a change that affects nearly 10,000 stakeholders in your organization. You have identified the affected stakeholders, analyzed and prioritized them. Okay, stakeholder analysis, very good. Um, high impact, high influence usually, and are putting together a communication plan to ensure that the right engagement is made. What will you not include in your plan? Oh, well, that makes it simple. Communication plan, what do we not include in that? Okay, uh, and what have we got here? We've got why, what, how, and when. Hmm, I th they all sound pretty good. Let's get a bit more information. Why should information be shared with stakeholders? That's the why behind it, the vision, uh, the reason for everything. That's pretty good. What is the best way to provide them the information? Definitely that one. We want to work with them and give them what they need. How can they make changes to the communication plan? Um, I don't think they're necessarily making changes to the communication plan. That's more what we're here for. Um, and we, will, we need to take into consideration their feedback. So, uh, so we're sort of doing that anyway. I think that's a low maybe for now. Let's see what the last one is. When and how often is information needed? Well, definitely that one. So we want to be communicating in the way that they need and how often they need as well. Uh, so I think what we're not going to include, let's put answer C for now. Excellent work. Planning communication for the project entails considering the following, who needs the information, who has the information that they need, why should information be shared with stakeholders, when and how often is the information needed, what is the best way to provide the information, what information does each stakeholder need. That's actually really, really good. And that's in your communication plan Page 64 in the Pomod Guide 7th edition. Great stuff. I think I'm actually going to use that in the real world because communication is so important on a project. So important. And when you stop communicating, then you start hearing about it from your stakeholders as well. <laughs> so that's always, you know, they'll definitely let you know. But I will also let you know we're down to last two questions in this section. Let's get to this. You put together a resource plan for a large amount of physical inventory to be purchased from overseas. You ordered the inventory during project execution. However, global supply chains were impacted and the shipment was delayed by three months, significantly impacting your project. What should you have done differently? Oh, goodness. Okay, how can we work with this? Um, so we, we did it during project execution. Is there a better way? So. Sounds like we needed to do it earlier, obviously, but you know, how, how do we get it, go about that? Should we have hired a resource manager to take care of the resource tasks on your project? Maybe. Let's put it that as a maybe for now. Planned strategically about the timing, definitely. From order to delivery to usage, definitely. Managing resource risks and their responses, and I guess these, uh, this impact, is a, was a risk that turned into an issue, wasn't it? So were we even aware that this was potentially going to happen in the future and it was a risk on our project? We needed to manage that risk. This is actually a really good one. This is a great answer. Let's see what else we have, but that's probably our one. Ensured a means to track the inventory from arrival on site to the delivery of an integrated product. Uh, even though we're tracking it, that doesn't manage all those risks either, does it? So let's put a no for now. Sourced the inventory locally to reduce the impact of local supply chains. That's a definite possibility, but for our purposes, um, uh, you know, it, it seems like in the question, it has to be purchased overseas. So even though that's a good option, if we have that option available, we're not sure. I think, and plus would be, if we were managing it correctly, then that would be a part of managing it correctly as well. So I still think, let's go with answer B. Excellent work, all right. Project teams whose projects require significant physical materials think and plan strategically about the timing from order to delivery to usage. This can include evaluation of bulk ordering versus the cost of storage, global logistics, and more. Page 65, physical resources in the Pumbo Guide 7th edition. And that's, yeah, that's really, really good information to have as well. So wonderful things that we've learned in this set of questions. And we're down to our very last one in this section. Well done, guys. Let's get this done. 
you are halfway through your Agile project when there is a significant change to the project scope. After it was found that the project would not be able to deliver the benefits that it had promised. You check your project budget and there are contingency and management reserves available. What will you do next? Okay, good, good information and we've been through those contingency and manage, management reserves, that information before already. So take the project scope change to the change control board for approval. I um, mean, maybe, let's see what else we have. Use the available contingency reserves to make the appropriate change to the project scope. And remember, contingency reserves are for project risks and management reserves are for unforeseen scope, usually, that's still approved within the project. So contingency reserves, that doesn't fit. Let's put a no for now. Review the change management plan for the change control process. Um, I think we need to do something else first. Let's see what else we have. Reprioritize the backlog. And I see we're on an agile project, so that does fit, including the new scope, and begin work on the highest priority item straight away. Uh, I, you know what, actually that, that actually fits. So if we've got a new scope item or a new feature, we just reprioritize that, and you know maybe this one drops off at the end instead. So. Either way, we're still working, always working, but we're working on the highest priority items. And that's the way that Agile and the prioritized backlog works. So we don't need to worry about scope, uh, you know, about reserves or anything extra, extra cost. We're just reprioritizing, and uh, if something low value doesn't get done, then that's what happens. So for that reason, I think we're gonna go with answer D. Excellent, okay. Changes may occur as a result of a risk event, environment change, a deeper understanding of requirements, customer requests, and more. Project teams should prepare a process for adapting plans throughout the project. In an agile team, this may take the form of reprioritizing the backlog instead of a formal change control process with project baselines. Page 66 under changes in the Pumbok Guides seventh edition. And here we are, we did 10 questions just like that. That felt quite easy. Are we getting better at this? Maybe. I know I'm certainly learning a little bit, but more importantly, I truly, truly believe that you can pass the PMP exam. But not only that, it's one of the most important things you can do for your career. Projects are everywhere and they are not going away. There's just more and more change happening every single day. Your skills are so important and we need them so much around the world. You can do this. Keep going, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye for now.